Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Real Rescue, powered by Vertical Helicast. A big shout out and thank you to our sponsor for this episode, Breeze Eastern. Now, coming up next in this episode, we are joined by a retired captain from the U.S. Coast Guard. She's also an award-winning author. She's got plenty of stories and she's bringing them here. So please welcome Miss Martha LaGuardia Cotite. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Real Rescue Podcast. Man, I love it. You got another U.S. Coast Guard officer who's joining us right now. I'm very excited about this one because she is a retired captain out of the Coast Guard. She's an award-winning author. She does keynote speaking, been on TED Talks all over the place, whole bunch of stuff that's amazing. She's also an expedition specialist, which I'm excited to hear all about that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome... Martha LaGuardia Cotite, how are you? Hi, Quinny. It's so awesome to be here. I'm so honored to be on your show. And amongst all these amazing heroes that you have interviewed, I am in awe and have so been looking forward to meeting you and talking with you. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for joining me. I mean, I I love the stories that everybody gets to bring on and, and tell. And, and it actually kind of another reason you and I talked is you wrote a specific book, which has stood out to me and it's called So Others May Live. I'm going to throw that out right away because it's all about how the Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer Program came about. And you have like in-depth detail about how that, plus stories from after the inception of the Rescue Swimmer Program. So yes, yes. I like it. What a, what a- what a wonderful uh, tribute to people who do so much and put their lives on the line for others. So others may live. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I'll tell you what, Martha, before we get too far into it, let's, uh, let's get a little background about you. So where are you from? Kind of grew up. What, like, what brought you to be in the Coast Guard, Coast Guard officer at that? And then you did all the way to captain. Wow. Congratulations <laughs> on that. That's amazing. So how did all that happen for you? Wow. Well, it took a few decades. Uh, <laughs> and when I think ah. back, it, it went by fast. Um, and I'm just as young as when I first started, or I feel that way anyway. <laughs> nice. Nice. Me too. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I, I grew up in a little fishing village at the time called Destin, Florida. And there's this amazing station there now, Coast Guard Station Vacation. They finally refer it to um, but the men and women that serve there are top notch and extraordinary. And um, so I grew up in that area. I was a sailor. Yep. One of those. Yes. And I love being on the water and uh, didn't know much about the Coast Guard at all. And then my father said, well, I am not going to pay for your college education. And I thought, oh, no, how am I going to pay for college? Because I do want to get out of this fishing village and see the world and get a great education. <laughs> so it, it started with that. And then uh, full disclosure here, sadly, my senior year of high school, my older brother who had graduated and was now at a university in Florida uh, took his life. And oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was eye-opening. It was tragic. It was something that changed my life, rocked my world. And I thought, if he can't make it, how can I? So it was really terrifying, all those things combined together. Um, and I recognize at the same time how short and fragile life can be. Yeah. And wow. it takes a lot from uh, being this selfish teenager in high school who all I thought about all I thought about was you know what am I going to wear and the things that we think about when we're so young and don't have a reference point as to the meaning of life and um, so I was able to grow from the experience and recognize that I wanted to live a life that made a difference 
And if I could in some way save lives, and I thought, oh, I can prevent suicides from happening in my little circle of the world. And I truly believe that. So when um, fast forward, uh, I went to Auburn University. I had applied to the service academies, didn't get accepted got close to getting a congressional appointment for one of them, but that didn't happen. So I went to Auburn University for my freshman year and joined the Navy ROTC and quickly realized the Navy was not for me. Uh, and the jobs that they would have women do back then were not something I wanted to be a part of in that, um, gender mattered, like you would be assigned certain positions and certain jobs. And the um, perspective of women in that service in the Department of Defense at that time was not so good. So I looked at the Coast Guard again, and this is when I realized all jobs are open. There are no gender restrictions. If I wanted to fly, if I wanted to drive a ship, if I wanted to serve ashore, I could do it. I just needed to meet the qualifications and gender didn't matter. So boom, I'm like, hey, I'm gonna apply to the Coast Guard Academy. And I had a Navy ROTC scholarship, which could enable me to stay at Auburn and pay for my college education. And uh, thankfully I got appointed to the Coast Guard Academy at Station Destin. I was presented the appointment letter Yep. Oh yeah, rough. And, and right the station awesome. vacation right off the get-go. Yes, yes. That's awesome. Yes, awesomeness. But I didn't know that's what they called it back then. I was just, oh my gosh, I'm doing this. I'm doing it. So off I went to New London, Connecticut, and um joined the amazing class of 1989. Nice. Way to drop it in there. I like that. <laughs> nice. And then went back to Destin. So for everybody that doesn't know, Destin, Florida is what? Beautiful, white, sandy beaches. The water is crystal clear. It's warm most of the year, all the way around. It's gorgeous. Like, it's gorgeous. It's like vacation. There. Yeah. <laughs> so the fact you were like raised there and then, or grew up there, I should say, and then went back there as your first unit. It, well done. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And yeah, so 30 some odd years later, I went back and had my retirement ceremony there. And thankfully, the master chief um, said, sure, we'll we'll put it on. We'll help. And um, it, it's been wonderful to still be connected to the Coast Guard and um, a wonderful family, as we all say. Oh, that's cool. I like that. I like that a lot. All right. So now I have to ask, I mean, I, how many years do you do? Uh, 29 plus. So I round up to 30 because it's a little more than 29 and that's commissioned, uh, doesn't count the Academy time, unfortunately. So around 29 wow. plus 30 years. Jeez. Oh man. Good for you. 30 years. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. So uh, we got it. We got to dig deep. We got to dig deep. Do you by a chance remember your first search and rescue call out? Oh, boy, oh, boy. Um, well, and there's a couple of things that immediately come to mind. And and one I should share was very dramatic, uh, personally and professionally. And, I, and I'm going to start with um, while at the Academy during a summer, we all went out to do different summer things. So we were attached to operational units. And this goes back to the service effect ships, which have you ever heard of them? <laughs> uh, actually, no, I don't even know what you're talking about. So uh, I'm we, starting to we, sound... gotta, we gotta circle that, yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm starting to sound like a dinosaur. I promise I am no, not No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so service effect ships, the Coast Guard had three and they were given to us by the United States Navy. And they're 110 feet long and very wide, like let's say 45, 50 feet wide. I don't remember the number. And the three service effect ships were in Key West. And um, this was before we brought our 110s down there. So I was assigned as a cadet from the academy to uh, the Seahawk. So it's Seahawk, Shearwater, and Petrol. So I was on the Seahawk. And um, 
learning what it would be like to be on a patrol boat in one of the busiest places that we patrol off of Florida. And we were patrolling here, there, and everywhere. And one day we came up close to the Bahamian waters near Quesal Bank. Have you ever flown out there? I have not, no. Okay, so um, a known area for drugs and immigration issues to be happening. And on the horizon, I'm standing up on the bridge, um, we're looking through our binoculars and we're seeing way out on the horizon, a brown small sail. And everyone was like groaning the crew because they, they're pretty seasoned uh, sailors and they're like, oh, and I'm like, well, this is exciting. We get to save some lives. And they're like, oh, you just wait. So as we got closer, we made the interdiction and it was a small wooden sailboat carrying dozens of Haitians and they were literally stacked on the boat and this rescue if you will was so dramatic it just it goes on and on and suffice it to say it got to a point where they're like we are not going on the coast guard uh, patrol boat because we know that brings us back to Haiti eventually and there were some yeah. repeat uh, folks that were trying to leave their country on anything that could float so they were wiser and they knew more and they told everybody, no, don't go, don't go. And <clears throat> so trying to move the story along a little bit, at one point they're well, throwing- Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't, don't do that to me because oh. I, I like details. <laughs> I love the I love the intricate details of every story. So you do not have to cut anything out for me. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, at one point, so keep in mind, these people have been at sea for a long time. You can smell- the odors, uh, they're stacked in there, they're hunched over, they're just trying to stay on the boat. Uh, we get information through translations that, yeah, they'd lost a couple people, they'd seen sharks and things, and now they are not going to leave this boat just to be taken back again eventually through the process. So the tensions uh, gearing up, we're trying to convince them to put life jackets on because it's not safe. And we didn't want to see anyone drown. We wanted to help them. And of course, we had to follow what the policies were at the time. We had to do what we uh, were told to do um, officially. And at one point, I remember one of the gentlemen uh, grabs one of the babies on board and holds it out over the small engine that they also had attached to the sailboat, so threatening uh, to do something with the baby. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. They cut the neck off a chicken and they give us some kind of voodoo curse. And I was like, holy moly. And um, so at some point, you know, all this is going on. They beach their sailboat on one of the banks there and they figure they can run ashore. And they're smart, right? So they're now in Bahamian waters. They're now evacuating the boat on an island that's very remote, desolate, like a desert in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, just to the east, if you will, of the Florida, the Gulf Stream. And um, so we are now getting permission to enter Bahamian waters. At some point, some immigration and naturalization agents arrive that can also speak Creole. And uh, somehow or another, we are able to get a lot of these folks on board and eventually all of them because no one would be left alone on this island without food and water. So now they're all on board our service effects ship. And I mentioned how wide it is. So a great place to put people in a safe area out on the outer decks because we couldn't for security reasons bring them in. Yeah. And let's say there was 40 or 50 of them. Um, so we bring them forward on the bow. And um, I think we also rigs a little blue canvas to protect them from the intensity of the heat. And um, and so we start now navigating away and the captain's planning the rendezvous with a larger Coast Guard cutter. And, uh, you know, the watch schedule begins and we have guards on the outer deck in the passageway alongside um, the port and starboard side, stopping them from going aft, which is where we had a bucket 
which the buckets use for them to relieve themselves if they needed to, but they would be allowed like one at a time to go back there. And of course we're feeding them, we're giving them water. They're getting yeah. really a great, um, a great uh, help, if you will, only that they, everything's being taken care of. They've been checked for weapons and for health and safety. Uh, the only thing that they don't want is to be returned to their country. Holy cow. So now that we're underway, we're rendezvousing with a larger cutter, but that's going to be, you know, 24 or more hours away. And I know my watch is coming up. So I go to my cabin and I'm trying to get some rest before I have to be back on watch. And um, on the ship, there, uh, there's me and the cook who are women. The rest are men and probably a similar crew to a 110, let's say 16 people. And my, um, I'm sleeping in the stateroom and I hear this bop, 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 bang on the door. Cadet LaGuardia, that was my maiden name. Cadet LaGuardia, Cadet LaGuardia, come up to the bridge. The captain needs you on the bridge immediately. Hurry, hurry. I'm like, what happened? Open, and I open the door and she says, there's a revolt. There's a revolt. They're trying to take over the ship. I'm like, who? She's like, the Haitians. They're trying to take over the ship. Get to the bridge, get to the bridge. So, you know, I get dressed, scramble up to the bridge and the captain... Harry Haynes, I'll never forget it. Great leader, great officer, great commanding officer says, okay, now Martha or Cadet LaGuardia, I want to make sure we don't run aground and that's your job. Just keep us steering in a safe direction. <laughs> make sure we don't run aground. I'm like, aye, aye, sir. So with the bridge watch, you know, our job is to navigate. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, oh my God, is someone going to come up on the bridge? And like, what's going to happen? Will they actually take over the ship? All these things running through my mind. I'm not armed and, and I know we have security on deck that do have you know, weapons or skilled training to defend. And um, so like there's, a, I'm just imagining this hustle and bustle happening on the weather decks and worried that someone's gonna show up at any point and say like, give me control of this Coast Guard cutter. <laughs> and then what do you do kind of thing. So the drama plays out. Of course, I can't go look because I'm supposed to keep the ship safe. and. Um, so as the story goes, uh, all is well eventually. And what happened was, um, again, you know, they don't want to be returned to their country. So they will do anything to not have that happen. They yeah. put their life on the line. They've survived over a month at sea and they were so close. And for many of them, this had been a second time and they've already given up everything they own. They have no possessions. This is their one and only goal is to come to America. And um, so what happened was we had people stationed on the port and starboard side in the passageway that leads down the exterior side of the ship. And one of the ladies had said that she needed to go to the bathroom. So when she was allowed to pass and the security uh, law enforcement petty officer on that side let her pass, he was overrun by any number of the Haitian men. Wow. And so they rushed him, got past, and they were now like fighting to come to the bridge, <laughs> take over the ship. Oh my so, gosh. Uh, yeah. So it was very dramatic, very scary. And I was like, oh. So thankfully, everything got back, put back in its place, if you will. And we ended up rendezvousing with a cutter and offloading them and I still remember thinking back to that moment when I first saw the Haitian sailboat on the horizon through the binoculars thinking yay we get to save somebody to wow this was way, way more than I could have ever imagined and I'm sure the crew felt the same way it's not often that that, that kind of thing happens and you're just trying to do the right thing and they're trying to do the right thing for them wow Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that was my first rescue, if you will, that uh, happened as a cadet. And um, yeah, it was quite memorable. <laughs> yeah. Holy smoke. That is not something that I would have expected. Uh, trying to overrun a, a anything Coast Guard related boat. Oh my right. gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, my heart goes out to people like that that are seeking a better life, and it's tough. It's tough. It's heartbreaking. Oh my gosh! Yes, yes, yeah. 
Yeah. And welcome um, to the Coast Guard. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it was quite a, a lesson in uh, how we have a job to do and our personal uh, desires or beliefs may not be able to be expressed or um, accounted for. Right. Uh, we are professionals and we do the job that we've been asked to do. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Well, wow. Thank you for sharing that story. That's, <laughs> that's wild. Not what I was expecting. Not even close. <laughs> Not even but close. that's why I do. Oh, wow. I love this. This, this is why I love doing this. I love these stories. Um, oh, let me let me bring it out to another one because you actually. I, I'm going to bring this up right here. You, you actually. So in your 30 years in the Coast Guard, eh, sorry, 29 plus, close, close, <laughs> rounding up to 30. Um, you have a couple like, um, I'm going to call it tours. Like, is that a tours around the ship as well as I'm assuming? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you had a couple of tours with two Coast Guard cutters with all male crews. Uh, that's interesting. And as you, as the the officer woman on board, did you turn into like the mom? Were you like mom to everybody? Like, got to put everybody, <laughs> hey, hey, I will ground you. You will go to your room. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's so funny that you say that because, um, you know, being a young officer on my second tour, let's say my second tour of float. So back to back, I'm now a Lieutenant junior grade on a 110 foot patrol boat, a back to Key West, ironically, something about being there Nice. <laughs> and crew of 16 men, first woman assigned to this cutter, this patrol boat in the history of that cutter. And, um, the dynamics were, were, were very uh, interesting in that uh, being the first as executive officer, um, the captain that was there, thankfully for only six months, was clearly not happy that, that he had a woman officer on board. Um, and that was just his personal thing. Clearly not happy. But um, thankfully, I had an amazing, amazing crew. And we pulled together. And I had to learn a lot about my position on board being the executive officer, the disciplinarian, like you say, and the only woman, like, how do you do this? And I didn't want to come across as being a mom. Uh, and I wanted, again, to be that professional person that's there to do a job and do it the best I can and show great leadership. And at the same time, we're all learning, right? Our, our leadership is evolving. And I remember one instance where this bosun mate, um, Duncan is his last name, Chip, Chip Duncan, uh, like a redhead from Georgia, Southern guy. So you have a little bit of that, um, uh, very forthrightness. He's a little Southern, maybe a tad chauvinistic, but also really fun. He's a hunter. He's a farmer. He's on board as a bosun mate, second class. And he did something. I don't remember what it was. Um, but I was like, okay, I, I can't let this fly. I just can't let it go. So they always say, you know, counsel in private, right? I'm like, okay, all right, done. I'm report to my stateroom. So he comes in and I'm all prepared to just like let him have it. And he's standing at attention and I'm standing at attention and we're both staring at each other and the door's closed. And he starts laughing. And I start laughing. We're like, can we just agree to disagree or, you know, move forward? I'm here. I have to, I'm in charge of that, whatever that was. And I need you to help me out here and let's, let's do this together. And uh, so he didn't get, you know, the, the knockdown yelling uh, version, um, but he and I had a great agreement um, that, yeah, we're going to work together. We got to be a tight team to do the things that we're required to do. And, um, and as you know, uh, probably on a patrol boat, when you're a crew of 16 and you got to go out and do a boarding or you've got to do the mission or you've got to drive through the night to get to that position that you're supposed to be, it's exhausting. It's all hands on deck and you don't have time to doubt 
who you're uh, working next to. We all pull together. So it was a funny uh, moment. Um, and there were others, of course, being on a ship, you get to know each other's uh, preferences. Like the cook knew I love nutter butters. So one day I walked down to the galley and he pulls open a drawer and XO, these are for you. I'm like, oh, no, your butters. <laughs> so yeah, uh, and, and it was tough from a female side in that if you were having a bad day and maybe a little emotional hormones, you know, whatever, like, who do you go to? Who do you, who do you go to yeah. to say, I have cramps and I feel like shit and oh. <laughs> You just, you just have to put all that aside. And again, that your gender doesn't matter. Uh, do the job you're supposed to do and, and be a human too. Like be, uh, be someone that, that people can count on and come to if they, if they need something, which is what I'd like to say. I was a, a leader that the door was open, come to me. Um, I want to help you succeed. I'm, I'm all about empowerment and helping others achieve their dreams. Nice. And not just one ship you did that to, you did it to two. Well, on the first ship after leaving uh, the Coast Guard Academy and getting my commission was a 210 foot cutter. So my roommate and I were the first two women on that ship. Nice. So it was me and one other. And when we walked aboard that ship, they clearly had not served with women before. They were not interested in serving with women. And the majority of the men made it known that uh we really don't like that you're here and oh by the way women are bad luck at sea that's the sea lore and we believe in it and then to add to that when we got underway and because i was on the deck side uh deck watch officer i'm up on the fly bridge and you know we're waving to the families and the wives and girlfriends are all standing on the pier waving back and they're like they didn't like the fact that Annie and I were getting underway and sailing out to sea. Um, so there was kind of got it from all four corners and until you proved yourself and had a small handful of folks like the chief quartermaster, uh, Steve Mackey, who I still am in touch with today, said, you know what, I, I believe in you and I know you can do this and I'm going to make sure that you get the chance, you get the shot. So we were yeah, able to cool. qualify, do our job, and and I was blessed with the next assignment, which was such an honor to be executive officer on a patrol boat. Man, that's that's really cool. I, out of my own curiosity, how did you how did you work through some of that to not deter you from being like, screw this, I forget, I, I'm I'm done with it. I'm this is not what I'm here for. How did you get through some of that, you personally? Uh. Well, I, I, for me, you're in that moment, you're in this assignment, and I don't think about quitting. Um, nice. It's not in my nature. Uh, you know, walk back to a tiny bit related. Um, having lost my brother, I'm now a survivor. Yeah. And having gone through the academy, it showed me I can do more than I ever dreamed. Um, and, you know, with my classmates and those shipmates that believed in me, you just you find this inner strength that is beyond what you ever imagined you had and you're discovering it along the way. Um, so having some support, having some believers, having some mentors and loving what I do. I love being in the Coast Guard. I believe in the missions of saving lives and protecting the environment. Being at sea was amazing. Uh, you know, seeing the sunrise and the the sunsets, the the nature, all of that blended together and feeling like I was doing something, doing some good um, was more than the aggravation or the tough moments. Uh, and yeah, there were plenty of tough moments uh, like we all have. Yeah. Because oh, yeah, life yeah. is tough. Right. Hey, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good to know. Good I so I, the other part about it is um, you mentioned being at sea. So that's something that I, I actually never had to do. Uh, in, while I was in the Coast Guard, I was, I'd say I went to the Honor Guard for two years and then I went to aviation. That was wow. it. Yeah. My, thank you. My my stint on a boat 
was like me arriving on the boat to get a ride out for the helicopter to come get me. That was that was my extent oh, wow. of being on any boat. So uh, as you're underway and you're doing this, you guys have a very unique mission. Uh, and when I say you guys is in the, the U.S. Coast Guard boat side of the world, you know, you are the... Let me say the search and rescue side is not like the helicopters. And I had this, Liz mentioned it, where it was like a two-day SAR case that they're going out. And you just talked about with the Haitian stuff. That's not something that, that I'm familiar with on the air side of it. Because we're going out like right now, go get them, come back. By the way, you've got four, maybe five hours, because that's all you've got for fuel, and you're done. So for you... What are some of the, the rescues that might have stood out for you throughout your time on all the vessels? Some rescues that stood out? Yeah. Um, well, I know this is rescue focused. Um, I can't I can't say that we actually did a lot of rescues, if we will. Uh, there was one case in Alaska, which sadly, uh, we did have a helicopter detachment, which um, was sent ahead for a search and rescue case where the mayday call was sent by a fishing vessel that they were taking on water, they called for help. So we immediately, you know, change course, the cutters en route to that last known position, the helicopter has launched and they're flying there and they get there first. And by the time they get there, they can see where the debris line was and where the last place that, that the vessel was. And it, had apparently had um, not ballasted well, and one of the tanks um, was full of water and changed the uh, center point, center of gravity, and it rolled and sank, and everyone went down with it. So oh, it, it no. was heartbreaking. Yeah, it was heartbreaking to get on scene and see debris popping up from the depths of the water in in the Alaskan area where we were. Where uh, as you know, you know, cold water, um, chances of survival diminished. They went down with their fishing vessel. And so I, I don't have uh, that come to mind anyway. I, I guess I'm <laughs> tend to remember. No, that's okay. These... Well, let me divert then, because again, a lot of the boat world, this is again a world that I don't know enough about. So I'm, I'm more curious than anything else is. There's a lot of law, law enforcement, fisheries deployments and yes. uh, patrols. So yes. uh, what about some of that as far as what you guys would get called out to or on your uh, deployments in your whatever area you're sailing to and from? Yes. What are you looking for? What are you doing? Yeah. Uh, and it varies based on where you are geographically and what type of um, ship you're on. So um being on the medium endurance cutter sailing the Pacific, we sailed the Pacific. And my first patrol as an ensign, having walked on board, stowed my gear, boom, we're off to the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Oh, what? Oh my gosh. And wow. so that was my first patrol, first major event as a commission officer. And, um, Interesting enough, I, I do remember, you know, the armada, if you will, of fishing vessels that were coming to help clean the beaches, to help run the boom, to help contain everything. And the Coast Guard's role there was so significant. And we had, uh, I remember walking the beach with a warrant officer from uh, the Marine Inspections, and we're slipping on these boulders that are covered in oil, and we're lifting things up and there's more oil underneath on the rocky shoreline it was just horrid and you know you're seeing um wildlife covered in oil and it's quite eye-opening and the significance of that uh case for me not only being there for that was that uh this was at a time when no one and still today i feel like the military really doesn't want to talk to the media if they don't have to so this was even more pronounced uh, when the Coast Guard needed a spokesperson to share what we're doing, how are we making things better, to talk to these small towns, Whittier and um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the other town, Homer, Alaska, right. places that are only accessible by seaplane, maybe a train 
or boat, but you can't drive there. I mean, they're isolated. And um, no one on the ship wanted to be that spokesperson to say, this is what we're doing. Here's how we're making it better. Uh, and here are the challenges. And so they needed someone to write the press release to be the spokesperson. And I'm like, well, I like writing. Um, I don't mind talking to people. I'll, I'll do it. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll do it. So that was um, one of those moments where you're like, whoa, I can do this. So I learned uh, what I would be doing starting there for the next 30 years, um, how to talk with press, how to become a spokesperson uh, for the United States Coast Guard, which led to so many other opportunities that I truly found my passion as a storyteller, a spokeswoman, and ended up being handpicked by the Commandant Admiral Allen to be his press secretary when I was a reserve officer, which is unheard of for any reserve oh to be gosh. activated and put on the Commandant's staff. And you can probably pr appreciate that being in the honor guard. I mean, oh, yeah. holy cow. Um, not many people get to do the things that you have done, uh, especially in that that position of they have vetted you and you rose to the occasion and you did it. Um, well, thanks, but this isn't about me. This is about you. <laughs> oh, I'd rather talk about you. No, <laughs> no way. No way. Not a chance. <laughs> no, it. this is great. So all, all the man, Admiral Allen is calling you to be part of his team to write. Wait, I hold on. I got I to gotta back up to the Exxon Valdez thing. This is amazing. So randomly, uh, my uncle was in the Coast Guard and he was, um, so uh, Captain McGuire is what I know him as, but uh, Dennis, Dennis McGuire, do you know him by chance? Why do I know the McGuire name? But I don't remember uh, it being Dennis. Yeah, uh, Dennis, Dennis McGuire. He, so my, my uncle, he was in the Coast Guard. He was actually one of the guys that went up to Valdez to, to respond to the Valdez crash and that whole oil spill. And for those that don't know, the oil spill was a huge deal up in Alaska. I mean, it dumped Oh, if I remember correctly, I'm going to have to look it up. So I'll post it right here. But some yeah. stupid, big, large amount of oil went all over Alaska. And um, I remember my uncle saying, like, it actually, between the Coast Guard and the local fishermen and people that volunteered, they made the beaches and coastline of Alaska cleaner after the oil spill than it was prior to the oil spill with all the debris that they cleaned up because they cleaned up not only all the oil, but all the plastic, the buoys, this, that, what had washed up. So it, it was amazing. But the fact that you, they took you and you were letting all the towns know, because I know those towns. I flew in Alaska. So those I know, Homer, Cordova, Whittier, all yes. of us. And Valdez know, is a town yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you're right. It's so difficult to get to those towns. And you're the one talking to them. Hey, this is how we're <laughs> coming to help you guys. Right. Wow. And I wasn't. Yeah, but I was not the only one, but I was for our ship, the one that would go forward. Uh, and um, yeah, it, it really hooked me, hook, line, and sinker right then. Like, oh, I like I like doing this. I can do this. <laughs> nice. What else did you guys do in Alaska? I'm kind of curious. Oh. Uh, did you ever beer. get up? Hey, man, drink your beer. <laughs> Woo! Did you guys Lots ever of beer and halibut. Yes. Amazing. Beer battered hell of it. And then you mix the two together. Yes. Oh, amazing. So good. So, so good. good. I remember you at guys... one point, I don't know why this comes Go back, on. but uh, I came back from a night out with my, um, my roommate and I had, my bangs were cut and they weren't cut even. I'm like, what happened? Where, <laughs> why? <laughs> you cut it yourself? <laughs> Did you go in there and I fix it know. yourself? <laughs> <laughs> or she did. Martha, yeah. you need a piece of bangs. <laughs> <laughs> you maybe were standing on a ship and the ship was listening at the time. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Good times. Um, Good times. Did you guys ever get up and do any fishing, uh, fish patrol or law enforcement up along the U.S. and Russian waterway by chance? Um we didn't go that far north, but we did fish off the back of the boat, caught some amazing halibut while orca are spinning around our ship. It was oh. a beautiful moment. Um, what? Yes. Oh, you didn't do that as aviators? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we didn't do that one. 
<laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Some great fresh fish. And, uh, and then our patrols took us after Valdez. Um, we pretty much hunkered down further south and further west. Like we would go west. We went to Midway Island. Have you ever been there? No. The Goonie Birds. And there's a little golf course that you have to be careful because if you drive a, a golf ball down the beach or wherever the golf course was, you might hit a Goonie Bird because there's so many of them. Um, so Midway Island, of course, is historically significant. We pulled in there for fuel. And then we also went to Hawaii a number of times and uh, looking for vessels to inspect, looking for if we had intel on anything, you know, trying to find that vessel. We also went deep south, like Panama, Panama, and all those ports uh, from Panama coming back north to the United States through Mexico and California, the coastline. It was it was pretty pretty great to uh, see all that and and be there. Dang, that's incredible. All right, so let me bring us back to the East Coast real quick because you mentioned Florida. So you were down in the Keys. Um, is that right, the Keys? Yes. Yeah, okay. So in and out of the Keys, I, I, I'm very aware of, of the border protection there and what you guys were doing for people coming over from Haiti and Cuba and all this, trying to uh, immigrate to the U.S. and you guys are patrolling the waters there. What else were you guys doing down there or anything else that stands out to you? Uh, well, of course, inter you know, drugs, uh, uh, trying to interject right? drugs coming in. Yeah. Whether it was cocaine or um, marijuana, bales of marijuana, uh, and also helping other agencies. So uh, we did a number of um, boardings at night, if you will, that were part of a controlled environment where another agency said eyeball what's on this vessel who's on it and let them go um so i remember one sailboat had concealed uh kilos of marijuana within the galley bulkhead um and we had to let it go it was there was a larger fish to fry so to speak to capture and um you know we worked a lot with uh you know jtf4 which is um department of defense related larger intel base so yeah it was it was pretty awesome and uh working with other countries like the brits um learning how they operate and quite quite eye-opening um and uh, nice. a patriotic tour too i think you know celebrating who we are and what we do very cool out of curiosity yeah. what was your biggest bust biggest bust um you know, I, you know, I'm I'm randomly dropping all these questions on yeah, you because I, those are great I am questions. not and, I'm not the boat world guy, so I gotta ask all this stuff. I gotta learn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I can't remember those kinds of numbers and things like that. It was so long ago. Um, I will say though, one funny one was back as a cadet on that uh, surface effect ship. We were hunkered down behind an island, and there was uh, intel that an aircraft was coming. And that there should be a mothership. So the aircraft dropped these big, large 50 gallon barrels loaded with kilos of Coke to us. Because they thought you were the other vessel? They thought we were the mothership. <laughs> oh my so gosh. It was That's like awesome. gazillions of dollars worth and <laughs> stacks and stacks of kilos on that forward deck. Um, Oh my gosh. And we didn't have to even work for it. We're just <laughs> open your arms. Well, here we are. <laughs> oh I doubt my that gosh. would happen today, right? <laughs> yeah, probably not. That's pretty funny. Oh my gosh. That is pretty you funny. dropped it to the wrong ship, you bonehead. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh yep. man. Funny. Wow. We're going to divert real quick to thank our sponsor. Breeze Eastern. For over 80 years, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured battle-proven aerial rescue hoists, winches, and cargo hooks. Each product is carefully crafted to support demanding mission scenarios, ensuring the job gets done safely and efficiently. Visit them today at www.breeze-eastern.com. Um, All right, so I'll tell you what. Let's, um, let's jump out of the Coast Guard. Well, sort of out of the Coast Guard. 
Uh, because again, you got into your writing stuff. You mentioned it, uh, having to write and do all the stuff all the way up to the commandant being press secretary, press secretary for him. Is that? Yes. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and, and before that, if we could, I'd, I'd love to share how I became so in awe at the extraordinary heroism of our aviation community and people like rescue swimmer number 500. Holy cow. Thank you. Oh my goodness. So here I was, I'd done these two tours of float. I had people that believed in me. I'm a grassroots learning on my feet. I had five days of formal media relations training and I had done, you know, stories with international press with uh, the 1990s exodus of Cubans and Haitians, which is huge media story and thankfully people that believed in me said yeah she can do the job in Seattle send her to be the district public affairs officer so now I'm running an entire district the Pacific Northwest and I walk into the office one day and talk to my chief hey what are you guys working on oh yeah we're doing a reenactment for one of the regional television shows of a Coast Guard rescue done by a helicopter which flew partly into an Oregon cave and a rescue swimmer named Tristan Heaton was able to pull out one of the two survivors. I'm like, hold on, I'll stop. What, a helicopter flying into a cave? A rescue swimmer nearly dying, saving someone coming out? What is going on? So of course I had to know more and know as much as possible about this team of heroes and rescue swimmer Tristan Heaton and um, that opened my eyes to here I've been about six years in the Coast Guard now I'm a lieutenant how did I not know that (laughs) these kinds of things are happening so while you say you didn't know what was happening on the water per se with ships and patrol boats I had no clue the extent that you all have trained for to save lives, have done these missions and continue to evolve to meet these situations that you could not possibly predict. And in the end, you're successful. You do things so others may live and you are the calm in the world of chaos. So hearing this, I was like, my mind was blown. And to me, this was like, the biggest story I could ever possibly tell. Um, and I wanted to tell it. I love it. I love it. Uh, we all know Tristan's story pretty well as Coast Guard helicopter rescue swimmers. Um, he swam in. And as a matter of fact, he, and along with a couple other guys, but his specifically is the reason we do cave rescue training up at Cape Disappointment. Uh, and and you swim into the cave and you're swimming out against it and you got to be very careful because Tristan went in so the kids got stuck because the tide started to come in so Tristan swam in thinking he yep I'll get him out and he was swimming as fast as that current was going in and it was uh it was pretty gnarly they lowered that helicopter right in and and they ended up sending like the basket and some straps to float it into him so he could grab it and and actually yes. hoist and pull him out. It's insane. So I've been trying to get him on the podcast, but yes, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, Tristan, come on, so, Tristan. Yeah. So his story, I don't know if you could see this, um, his so story is chapter live, but... five. And so his story was the catalyst for me to say, oh my gosh, I've got to celebrate this kind of work that the Coast Guard does. And um, the book with due credit to my uh, seafaring uh, ship shipmates and those who prefer to be on ships rather than in the air. Uh, when I first put together a proposal for a book, it was about the 10 most heroic modern day rescues of the Coast Guard. And I ended up having to tweak it around and, and focus on uh, aviation. So um, I know there are great heroes out there who serve at sea on ships. Um, and this collection honors those who are rescue swimmers and that amazing air crew community uh, doing extraordinary things. Um, And yeah, it's been a real honor to be shared these stories where these folks nearly died and getting the interview for Tristan, um, again, he was my first story, wasn't easy. But as with anything in life, if you have people that support you and believe in you, uh, these folks 
knew that I was going to be authentic storyteller, tell it in a way that honors them. And um, being from the Coast Guard cloth, if you will, um, others were able to reach out to Tristan who agreed to share his story with me. And then the ball started rolling. And then I asked the rescue swimmer community and the pilots, like, who are the legends for you? Uh, who do you think I should include in the book? Even though I did gobs and gobs of research of all the cases that had happened up to that point. Um, but I was able to create a collection that they're proud of. That's awesome. And you, uh, you touch on quite a few of them in there. I know. And some of the guys that are in your book are actually on this podcast, Mario Vitone. Uh, you've got, um, oh my gosh, Jeff I Tunks. just forgot. Jeff Tunks <laughs> and the Bluebird. Oh gosh. Yes. Um, who else, who, who else is on your list that you have in there? Oh gosh. Um, well, of course I had the help of the first five. I interviewed any number of them who did the first Butch training. Wife and yep. see, who, Steve Ober. Who else? That's right. Um, yes. I'm just going to flip to the, I've got, um, well, Tristan's to almost die. The falls was Eric Mueller. Okay, Eric, yep. Oh my uh, gosh. Niagara Falls. He was oh instrumental in getting me in, in touch with Tristan. Uh Bow Mar Mariner was uh Dave Yoder and um I gotta turn to that page. You you know, I'm sure you know everyone in this book. Dave Foreman. Dave Foreman, um, yep. <clears throat> Dave Foreman was a couple <laughs> classes behind me. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, him and, and I still were served together in uh in Humboldt Bay. So, oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Bob Watson. You've probably heard Love of him. Love Bob Watson. He was episode 150 here. It's my longest podcast episode. Amazing stories. The dude oh. is unreal. He's one of my best friends. I absolutely love the guy. Yeah. Well, he, yeah. he refused to be interviewed by me for the longest time. And then I think enough people said, come on, come on, come on, <laughs> come on. She'll yep. do right by you. <laughs> yeah, it was great to talk to him. Oh my goodness. Um, and these stories are, uh, have captured my heart really. And I'm proud to continue to tell them and, uh, share them as a way of helping others see that, uh, my motto has become be bold, be first and be you, and that you can achieve more than you want. You can achieve your bigger dream. And I love sharing how, you know, saving lives can be one of those missions, can be one of those dreams, and and you can realize it. Man, I love that. You know what? I as a personal thank you, thank you for for writing that book for all the guys that are doing this. this. Is another reason why I try to do the podcast. I like to highlight those that have done incredible things. There's not enough recognition. There's not enough people that know. It gets it gets just lost in the wind. With it just gets lost. And that's, and I don't want to, I don't want our stories to get lost from the super simple going out to a Haitian boat as a cadet to <laughs> being up in Alaska and dealing with the Exxon Valdez. So I just, I don't, I don't want to lose these stories. They're incredible. And what we do and, on a daily basis is unreal. So thank you for doing that book for us. Uh, I appreciate it. That. You know, it, I, it, it's my honor and uh, I have enjoyed getting to know this community of heroes. I'm in awe by them. I'm humbled by you and your group uh, of what you have been able to do. And just like you said, <clears throat> you know, to write a book takes years, uh, not only of the research, but then the writing and then finding a publisher. So this was, I'm not self-published. I've published traditionally. And I could say that's like a, a mountain to climb in a way is to find a publisher that likes what you're talking about what you're writing about and likes your writing and but beyond all that the the real thing that kept me going was that people like Tristan had shared with me their story and their heart the moment where they nearly died and when I felt like I can't finish this book it's getting so hard it's so difficult or I was spending two years just trying to find a publisher you know am I going to be able to to get it published I didn't give up because I remembered I've been trusted with, with these stories, these heroes, I have to keep going. And not only was it to write this book and preserve this history, 
but it was to show America what the Coast Guard does because we weren't on the map before Katrina. No one really knew what we did or really cared. Yeah. And it was to put us on the map. It was to showcase what we do, preserve that history, and then also let the world know. Um, so now I go around the world and I continue to tell the stories on cruise ships, <laughs> ironically. <laughs> I love that. Which we're going to get into that in a minute too, because I am a little curious about some of that. But no, okay. this is awesome. I again, I thank you so much for for writing that book. Um, I, out of curiosity, I assume that with the book, it actually has the the reason the Coast Guard helicopter rescue came into fruition, and that was because of the uh, Marine Electric, which sank and twenty two souls were lost off the top of my head. Yes, I um, and it goes back to even before that, um, historically, and I, and I describe it in the book, there was, um, we'll go back a little bit further. We'll go back to the 1970s. So the Coast Guard Helicopter Rescue Swarm Program began in 1985. And in the 70s, so think 10, 15 years before, we had what we called SARWET, which was a volunteer group of folks that were in aviation, um, mostly on the West Coast, who said, we've got to do this a better way. They were noticing that people in particular that were incapacitated, people who couldn't help themselves, let's say they had broken their arm or their leg, or were hypothermic, or were unconscious, they couldn't grab that basket that was lowered out of the amphibious helicopter that we flew back then yeah. um, to help themselves get in the basket and be hoisted up to safety. Or the helicopter could land on the water if the sea stayed allowed, reach out and grab the person and bring them in. Um, so if those two options failed, people weren't being saved. And this was heart-wrenching to those who are in this community knowing there's got to be a better way yeah. so the sarwet folks started to experiment with different training techniques they gained some support um especially in like the california air stations but then when they transferred there wasn't necessarily support on the east coast let's say if they transferred from west to east there wasn't funding nothing was formalized it was all ad hoc and then wow. the coast guard felt we're unnecessarily hazarding ourselves. We're putting more risk where we don't need to. Um, and then keep going forward into time. There were two, what I say were the most significant disasters that let Congress know and then the American public know. It's amazing the power of Congress and the American public, right? You can make change happen if you know about it. Yeah. So one was Flight 90, which crashed into the 14th Street Bridge in Washington, D.C. in January during a significant snowstorm. And a lot of people died, and most of them died because they were hypothermic they, and they couldn't help themselves. They couldn't grab the lines with life rings that were tossed from shore. The river was iced over. We couldn't get there. We got bad press. We couldn't launch from Air Station Elizabeth City to get to DC because of the weather. Um, we couldn't put boats in the water because of the ice or couldn't get close to the scene. So for us, it was a bad news story. For the country, it was a tragedy. Yeah. And many lives were lost from that aircraft crash. So from that, um, we were given internally uh, a couple of folks who had known about SARWET started creating a plan for the helicopter rescue swimmer program. And you have, um, I'll have to go back to names, but um, some of the early rescue swimmers who are now in program management in Washington, DC, and Dana Goward, who was an aviator now in a position to make change happen through policy. So this team of people gathered all the information and the training techniques and the ideas, and they created the Helicopter Rescue Swimmer Program manual and training plan, which is now on the shelf, waiting for wow. funding. Wow. Wow. I didn't the, know that. Oh, it's yes. good information. Yes. So then it's on the shelf waiting to be greenlighted. Well, the money's not coming through, you know, budget, this, that, or the other. There were always other priorities, limited amount of funds. Then the Marine Electric happens, 
a year later. This is now in the Atlantic Ocean. This ship sinks. Um, many people, dozens die. Most yeah. due to hypothermia. And those that, you know, there were a handful that were rescued. Um, combination of, I think, the Navy and the Coast Guard were unseen to help pull out the few handful of survivors. So based on that helicopter rescue swimmer plan that was based on facts, you know, statistically, we lost between 37 to 42 lives a year based on people that were incapacitated or hypothermic. And that was a driving reason to make this ability, this new uh, technique available uh, throughout. So with the Marine Electric being the second major tragedy to highlight that there's a need and America was furious Congress granted funding and then the Authorization Act of 1984 for the United States Coast Guard authorized the funding of the helicopter rescue swimmer program. So the plan is now lifted off the shelf. It's got funding, it's green lighted, and boom, we're underway and running with training co located with the United States Navy in Pensacola, Florida. And you probably know the rest of the story. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I do. Wow, I, I that is a, some good information. I didn't know the very, the very early, early part of it. That's cool. Yes, That's very cool. And so, one of the things that I love to highlight when I go around the country and actually, you know, on the ship around the world, talking about being bold, being first, and being you is you could pull any number of the rescues from my first book, so others may live, and break down how everyone in that rescue was bold. They had to be bold and courageous. They were first many times doing something no one's ever done before from caves to cliff rescues to you name it. You know, this program has evolved to accommodate these crazy situations and they were themselves, they were authentic. And they pushed themselves beyond what they believed they could do to achieve this bigger dream. And in this case, so others may live. Wow. Man, that is deep. I like that. <laughs> you don't think about all that when you're doing a rescue, right? <laughs> no, no. It, it, you fall back on all your training and you you get the yes. job done or do what you can yes. to get it done for sure. Yes. So, um, Wow. Well, again, thank you so much for writing that to highlight all that. That's that's incredible. That's good. And the and stories you have in there are pretty gnarly. They're good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm glad. And because people are keeping it alive, this book's been out for like 17 going on 18 years. People enjoy reading and celebrating heroes like you. And I've heard folks say, I start it and I can't finish it in, in took a weekend, boom, I'm done. And it was, you know, seat of my pants or edge of the seat uh, uh, adventure. And um, there was something else I was going to say about that. Oh, so I think one of the things to keep in mind, like when we go through struggles in life or we have challenges, this program took 10 years from the Sarwet volunteers recognizing, got to do it better. There's got to be a better way to the unfortunate tragedies and then people still along the way believing there's gotta be a better way. Let's let's improvise, let's evolve, let's create, let's write it up, let's formalize it in a plan, let's get that funding. Anything is possible and it may take 10 years like in this case, but I'm sure there are people out there that are thinking there's gotta be a better way. Well, don't give up, don't give up. Don't give up, that's what I'm talking about. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's great. You actually have uh I, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip forward a little bit because you have another book, a couple books that you've written, which another yes. one is love. My it. name is Little Glory. It's a tribute to the power and passion of our flag. And um you've probably been to a retirement ceremony where that very emotional poem is read while the hand salute is given and the flag is transition the folded flag from the most junior to the retiree yeah oh my god i have it's a wonderful okay. poem wonderful poem I, i've been there through this war i've been there through that war i've stood high on this ground i've stood high on this ground i've been there yeah good, love it good job. Love it. i am the flag of the united states of america so i jeff tunks invited me hero from chapter three amazing rescue swimmer 
um, historic legend. Uh, he said, Martha, come to my retirement ceremony. I want you to share my story from your book. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm honored. And so I sh shared his story and then I get back to my seat and then they do the flag presentation to Jeff. And I'm like bawling because the power of the words and seeing this wonderful tribute of the flag being given to a hero. And I'm looking around like, is anybody else crying or is it just me? You know, get it together. And uh, so I wanted to bottle up what I felt that day. And the words actually are written by a, a World War II Marine, Howard Schnaber. And I know we change some of the words as we feel fit for using it uh, to honor those who are retiring. But the book has the, the actual words of his poem in the front with pictures. And then in the back, I've gone around and asked people what the flag means to them and included some history and some things to be mindful of, like don't let the flag touch the ground and don't fly the flag if it's torn and light right. it up at night. Things that I think yep. we should all be aware of. And let's oh, all fly while we're at it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I love it. I love that because there, there was so much it, so on a guard side of it. There was a lot um, of things that came back to me and that I learned about how you respect the flag. And, and I, you know what? I don't care what nation you're you're at. I mean, again, go America. Team America. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Um, but I, it's funny because I've traveled around the world like you and they other countries they they represent their flag they represent their country they hold their flag in a very high high regard yeah. and it's it's their nation well you know what americans are a nation that's yes. when i when i fly the american flag it's like this this is my home yeah exactly exactly and you know what i wish more people flew flags outside their front front porch uh wherever they can fly it and if you can't fly one maybe you have a, a picture of one in a frame I mean, can you imagine if more flags were flying and everywhere you went, you saw these amazing flags? Oh, it would be amazing. It would, I would love it. Love it. Yep. Fly it high, fly it proud. Yes. Heck yes. yeah. And we have a great country to honor and celebrate. Yep. Agreed. Very much so. Nice. Well, yeah, that's great. I, I love the fact that you wrote that one too. That's, yes. Somebody needed to. And in the women book. Well, if you had a second, could we touch on that? Absolutely. Hit it. <laughs> I get all so the time in the world. You done, Martha. I'm here for you <laughs> all day. <laughs> I don't think people want to hear us talking all day. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it's not about them. It's about you and I right now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> then we can talk about you. I would be excited. No, it's not my <laughs> podcast. It's your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So it's amazing how life is. I wrote this book. It was something that I was able to get speaking engagements from. Unknowingly, I did never anticipated becoming a speaker ever. And this book, So Others May Live, uh, people wanted to know more. And I was able to partner with uh, Mario Vitone on a couple events where he nice. came, spoke with me and told his story, which was phenomenal. And um, so now I'm on this speaking journey, helping keep the book alive, letting people know about this extraordinary collection of amazing people like you. And at one event, I was <clears throat> in DC and um, they said, we're gonna move the, the speaking venue of this panel that I was on down to another room. So this is at the Women's Memorial in Arlington, which is a, a military memorial honoring women who have served in the military. So I'm walking down to the room, down the hallway, and I go in to where we are. I'm a little ahead of, of uh, the rest of the folks coming down, and I'm getting set up. And then I'm walking around the room, and I'm noticing this memorabilia celebrating women. And then on a podium, a notebook, uh, you know, a few inches thick, and I'm flipping it open, and I'm getting all teary-eyed reading a little two-inch bio of dozens and dozens of women, page after page, who had served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they all died. They all oh, died. Oh, wow. And I'm like, is this it? This is all that anyone will ever know of these women that 
this little paragraph represents who they are and what they did for freedom around the world. And it so upset me that I thought, okay, I'm going to write a book about women who have served. And at first I thought, yeah, it should be the women that have died. And then I talked with other folks. They're like, well, if you can flip it a little bit and still honor women who have served and have a collection of women that are still living, which was actually great because now I could get more information by talking to each woman and about her journey and her leadership and what did she learn along the way? What were the challenges? How did she help change the culture of the military? And how did the military help her achieve her bigger dream? And uh, so that's this book, Changing the Rules of Engagement, Inspiring oh, Stories of Courage and Leadership from Women in the Military, which is also out in paperback now and an audiobook. So is So Is My Live. They're both audiobooks too. Nice. That's good because yeah. I, I do audiobooks way more. Maybe it's the podcast thing. I don't know. I just listen to stuff. You know, I'm really excited to hear and see that so many people are into the audiobooks. I personally am not, but I didn't realize it's so popular. Oh, yeah. Love it. Love, and this is a personal thing. Just just me. I can't speak for anybody else, but man, I'll, I'll get cooking. I'll go. I'll take the dog for a walk. I'll have headphones on. And I'm, oh, look, thumbs up. Hey, right. Thumbs up for audiobook. But I, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's. I do it all the time. Love them. Love them. Yeah. That's great. So, That's great. Yeah. So that book that you just wrote, the, the women in, in military and how they changed the wait, name. What's the name of it again? Uh, inspiring stories of courage and leadership from women in the military. So it's all services are represented nice. all ranks, officers and enlisted. And uh, these women have changed my life and helped me come up with my motto uh, not only from the so, so Others May Live book, but this book, this combo was like, boy, be bold, be first, be you. And I'm now this speaker who goes out in hopes that I can empower people and inspire people to believe in achieving their bigger dream, not just their dream, but your bigger dream. So I break down, you know, some of the, some of the ways to do that and share some of these stories, not only my own, um, but others, which led to um, a TEDx that I did a handful of years ago. And um, I feel like I'm talking about everything happened a handful of years ago. I'm, what have I done lately? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to find out. Don't worry. I'm asking. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I'll tell you what, I appreciate um, you and others that write books like this. And as a father of three daughters, I want my girls to have something to look at, something they can fall back and say, you know what? You, you can pave the way for yourself. You can go bigger, bolder, and take over the world. That's yes. Are you working on anything else that you're writing at the moment for possible future? Uh, I am working on a novel that um, is inspired by a true story, and it is Coast Guard related. And uh, I'm happy to say I finished the manuscript. It was very challenging and very exciting to have to figure out how to write fiction. And um, it's not my forte. I've been a nonfiction writer for years and I'm really enjoying. And again, I have people that are supporting me with sharing some of their stories, which is why it's inspired by a true story and believe in me. And uh, so I put this together and I can't say too much about it because I'm hoping that then when I do talk about it, I can say I have a publisher and it's going to be out and available uh, soon. But I think as this business goes, it could be a little while before that happens. It's all good. It's all good. I'm excited yeah. to hear about it already. This is this is good. Something to look Thank forward you. to. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. So I've got I've got just a couple more questions. I've had you on for a little while, so I don't want to take too much more of your time. But um, you mentioned your you're running cruise ships right now and, and Zodiac boats, like real, maybe not even real quick. I don't even care if it's real quick or not. What, what is this? What are you doing? <laughs> this is a hobby. So this is, has been keeping me busy. So I picked up this little post-retirement hobby where it combines all my passions, being at sea, telling stories, being close to nature and driving a small boat. So I am driving these 20 foot Zodiacs. They're called Mark fives or Mark sixes, depending if it's center console 
or an outboard motor. I've learned how to drive them and I am with a team called an expedition team. So I love being the boat crewman, if you will, the coxswain, and don't have to take these big leadership decisions to uh, be the expedition leader. I take guests on board my boat and we tool up to the glacier in Alaska or in other locations. We go around icebergs and we get close to orca and humpback whales and birds and rookeries and sea lions. And I've been doing this for over a year and a half. And so far I've been deploying, doing this in New Zealand and Australia, uh, Norway, the fjords of Norway, uh, the Arctic Ocean. I went to Greenland and Iceland this summer, which was phenomenal. And where else have I been? Alaska. And uh, oh what a great gosh. way to, yeah, to meet people, tell stories, bring my books along. And they're very interested in the story of the Coast Guard helicopter aviators and rescue swimmers, as well as other stories that I can share. <laughs> oh, my um, gosh. Yeah, you don't quit. You're you're just like me. <laughs> we keep going. What else can yes. be out of the plate? Well, I want to keep going. That's yes. awesome. Yes, that's great. Yeah, we have to keep keep going, right? Keep enjoying life and in uh, discovering what our purpose is, because uh, that's the other thing I truly believe is we all have a purpose and a place in this life. And don't be afraid of going for it. Go for it. Don't give up. Believe in nope. yourself. Surround yourself with supporters and uh, articulate what that bigger dream is. And once you say it out loud, you have to do it. <laughs> that's that is a fact. Once you say it. Oh, you got to follow through. Because when you don't follow through, they'll be like, oh, I knew he wasn't going to do it. Or I knew she wasn't going to do it. Yeah, no, yeah. you got to go. You got you to push forward. Yes. Oh, yes. I love that. I love <laughs> the fact that you just said it's like a part-time like gig for you. Just uh, just randomly jumping on a cruise ship, driving people around up to glaciers and around humpback whales, orcas. That is oh, so cool. <laughs> it, it really has been phenomenal and has just filled my soul with it's such a different experience from all that we've done in the Coast Guard or even on our own. I've always been a boater. I've always been out on the water, but getting into these little nooks and crannies, if you will, these places where most people can't go, um, these smaller cruise ships at Seaborne Cruise Line can go into these fjords and then launch the Zodiac and we get up even closer and um, seeing nature at its most magnificent um, is just fills my soul. It's incredible. I hope everyone who has a desire gets a chance to do this, to at least be on a Zodiac with me. <laughs> oh, okay. we might have to talk about that too. I might have to come meet you. Yes. How fun would that be? Oh yeah, my God. That'd be great. And that'd I'll bring great. my girls. Yes. Right. Like all four yes. of them, my wife included, because, you know, she's not going to, she, she does she's not, not come without me. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be the first one to say, hey, uh, you're not going without me. You know this, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Sounds like you've got an adventurous family. I love it. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they go all over the place. My wife travels all the time. My kids travel all the time. It's, it's amazing to see. I actually love seeing it through their eyes. It's so fun. Yes. So. Oh, that's great. And my husband and two sons um, uh, thought I was nuts for wanting to do this part-time hobby driving Zodiacs. And so I was fortunate to bring my two sons to Alaska. My husband didn't want to go, but he did come to Norway. And oh, so cool. <clears throat> at first my sons were like, mom, we're not getting on the Zodiac with you. And uh, the guests know that I've retired from the Coast Guard. So they fondly refer to me as Captain Martha. So most oh. people think that I know more than I know, right? They're like, oh, Coast Guard Captain? We're going on her Zodiac. So there's like this lineup to get on Captain Martha's Zodiac. And so Alaska was over a year and a half ago was the first time I've done this. And my sons are like, we're not going with you. And because they were embarrassed, they didn't want to be on the same boat with a mom with their mom, right? Right, right, right. But then they <laughs> surprised me and they hung back. And um, there's an order to, you know, lining up, going to the side gate, bringing on guests. So my sons told the dispatcher, Hey, we'd like to get on the boat with 
with our mom and these other ladies heard that like who's your mom they said Martha and they said oh you mean Captain Martha oh we're going with her too so I had this crowd come on board and my sons were part of it and the guests uh, were so sweet they're like we're so happy to see your sons want to be with you and I'm like well I am too (laughs) because I didn't think they were going to do that and then the guest said so Martha, how long have you been doing this? And we're about to go up to this glacier, right? Leave the ship, go up to the glacier. I'm like, uh, this is my first day. <laughs> and they're like, oh, back paddle. You know, everybody was fine. I promised the captain I'd bring everyone back. And I did. <laughs> oh, well done. Well done. <laughs> oh, Martha, this has been great. Thank you so this much has for been joining great. me. And, uh, um, I, I want to know more about your story at some point. So um, we I'm can sure, talk for sure. You know, you've, you've had a phenomenal experience and I am just honored that you wanted to spend time with me and share this with this community of listeners that you have built up. And I'm very proud of all that you have accomplished. And I thank you so much for your service and being one of the few who does so much so others may live. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that as well. Yeah. Uh, hey, for me, I'm just the host. I just, I'm, I'm along <laughs> for the ride of everybody else. It's it's great for me at this point. I love it. So, hey, uh, let me ask you one more question before I let you go. Is there any advice you'd pass on 30 years in the military, made it all the way to captain? What would you pass on to everybody? Well, and, and I would stick to what I've kind of been alluding to along the way is everyone has a purpose and a place in this life. And because I come from a place where early on as a young teenager, my brother took his life and committed suicide, and I'm a survivor of that, I'm particularly sensitive to understanding and knowing that there are many people walking around every day feeling suicidal. And I want those people in particular to understand you have a purpose, you have a place, and you can see the light because suicide is a selfish act. And it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So any struggles that any of us go through, we all go through them. I do too, through life. They're temporary. And if you can find a way to articulate what is your bigger dream and be bold, be first and be yourself. Be bold in terms of, yeah, it takes some courage and it takes some risk to go out there and do what your bigger dream is. Be first. You may be the first person to step out in your portion of the world in a certain way that you believe. You may see an alternative to the way things should be done, or it may be the first for you and your family. Go for it. Don't be afraid. Surround yourself with a team of supporters, people who believe in you. Find people that know more than you. Talk with them. How did they do it? Gain that knowledge. And be yourself, above all, be authentic to who you are and you will achieve your bigger dream, no matter what it is. And it may take 10 years, like the development of the Rescue Swimmer Program, but I believe that you can do it and you can see the light, even though it may feel dark at times. So let's all support each other, be bold, be first and be ourselves. And it's gonna be amazing. It's an amazing journey of life. Martha, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I cannot thank you so like enough for coming on. I so appreciate it. Uh, sharing the, the knowledge, the stories, the books, what you're doing now. I'm coming to hang out with you on a cruise. We're going on a Zodiac yes. together. Yes. Maybe and I promise I'll, I'll bring off. you back to the cruise ship. <laughs> yeah, but if I jump off, then you can come save me and pull me back in. Is that cool? <laughs> I- <laughs> yes, we, <clears throat> and that's hard to do actually. Well, that'll be another discussion is how do you pull someone in? Okay. Who's falling in the water? Oh my gosh. <laughs> maybe it's maybe a I'll, awkward. I'll accidentally fall off and then we can try. Okay. okay. There we go. Yes. And you'll rescue yourself, rescue swimmer. <laughs> huh? 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 Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> thank you. Right thank you. Thank you. You're Quinny, very you are welcome. an amazing person. And I appreciate what you're doing, helping share people's stories and uh, making a difference. Thank you. Well, it's certainly my pleasure. And I look forward to the day we get to hang out and kick back a cold beer. All right. That'd be great. 
Just Maybe one. we'll do it. Just, right? one. just one. Just one. Just one. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a beer battered halibut with a beer. Oh, Ooh, I am boom. in. I, I am love in. it. Awesome. And with right. that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. So now it's time for me to pull chocks and take off. But before I go, I'm always looking for the memorable rescues that people have done. If you have one that you're willing to share or know somebody who has a story, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to highlight it here at The Real Rescue. For everybody that is standing by for that SAR alarm, remember, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. So until next time, fly safe and swim hard. Thank you for joining me today here at The Real Rescue Podcast, powered by Vertical Helicast. We'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors for this episode. Breeze Eastern. For over 80 years, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured battle-proven aerial rescue hoists, winches, and cargo hooks. Each product is carefully crafted to support demanding mission scenarios, ensuring the job gets done safely and efficiently. Visit them today at www.breeze-eastern.com. My name is Old Glory by Howard Schnaber. I am the flag of the United States of America. My name is Old Glory. I fly atop the world's tallest buildings. I stand watch in America's halls of justice. I fly majestically over great institutes of learning. I stand guard with the greatest military power in the world. Look up and see me. I stand for peace, honor, truth, and justice. I stand for freedom. I am confident. I am arrogant. I am proud. When I am flown with my fellow banners, my head is a little higher. My colors a little truer. I bow to no one. I am recognized all over the world. I am worshipped. I am saluted. I am respected. I am revered. I am loved and I am feared. I have fought every battle from every war for more than 200 years. Gettysburg, Shiloh, Appomattox, San Juan Hill, the trenches of France, the Argonne Forest, Anzio, Rome, the beaches of Normandy, the deserts of Africa, the cane fields of the Philippines, the rice paddies and jungles of Guam, Okinawa, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Guadalcanal, New Britain, Peleliu, and many more islands, and a score of places long forgotten by all those who were with me. I was there. I led my soldiers. I followed them. I watched over them. They loved me. I was on a small hill in Iwo Jima. I was dirty, battle-worn, and tired, but my soldiers cheered me, and I was proud. I have been soiled, burned, torn, and trampled on streets of countries I have helped set free. It does not hurt, for I am invincible. I have been soiled, burned, torn, and trampled on the streets of my country. And when it is by those whom I served in battle, it hurts. But I shall overcome, for I am strong. I have slipped the bonds of earth to stand watch over the uncharted new frontiers of space from the vantage point of the moon. I have been a silent witness to all of America's finest hours. But my finest hour comes when I am torn into strips to be used for bandages for wounded comrades on the field of battle. When I fly at half mast to honor my soldiers. And when I lie in the trembling arms of the grieving mother at the gravesite of her fallen son. I am proud. My name is Old Glory. Dear God, long may I wave.